Last time we did something very important, namely a construction of special coordinates coming out from the geometry of a surface, geodesic coordinates. So I remind you what we did. We took one given geodesic gamma v okay, on our surface, and at least near some point, I mean, suppose this is gamma of zero, the, point, the initial point. We parameterize time, so we have a special time here. And for at least for small v, we have taken geodesics hitting the original one orthogonally, okay? And we call them gamma v of u. So this would be gamma of v, and this would be gamma v of u. Putting the two things together, so now we have two parameters, one moving on the, on the initial geodesic v, uh, gamma, and the other moving on the orthogonal geodesic gamma v. We have two parameters, v and u, and we constructed a, a parameterization, x u v, which is just gamma v u, okay? which works. We know that this satisfies the conditions of a chart at least around the point, the initial point. Okay, sorry, I saw, is this you? Okay. Now, when I, when we did that, I forgot to, to we used, we, we used already this theorem to, to solve an important problem. We classified completely surfaces of constant Gauss curvature. Okay. Constant Gauss curvature means positive, zero, negative, positive sphere, zero, the plane, of course, up to local isometry, okay? So piece of a sphere, piece of a plane, and piece of the pseudosphere, okay, in case of negative curvature. But actually, I suggest you an exercise, because what is this construction saying in the case of the sphere, as usual? Now, you, I mean, you can think, we, we thought of the sphere in many possible ways. One is like the, the, the inverse image of a regular value of a function, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 1. Okay? And we studied in this way. Or we did it by hand by covering uh, the sphere with graphs over different planes. Or we did the stereographic projection. Okay, so these are all different ways, but of course equivalent. These are all charts. Basically, what is this construction telling us on the sphere? Well, check that if you think of the sphere as a surface of revolution, this is really what's going on. Now, how the point is that the sphere is kind of a boundary case of a surface of revolution because the curve which is rotating is half of an equator, which of course touches the axis of revolution. This is something we always have wanted, avoided, but it touches orthogonally, so even at those points you get a regular surface. Okay? So in this point, the tangent vector to the curve is orthogonal to the axis of rotation, and this means that if you rotate, you still get a regular curve. You don't get cusps okay, by rotating them. If you think in this way, you would parameterize the, the sphere in this form, um, cos u, cos u, cos v, cos u, sin u, cos v, sin v, okay? Because the curve which is rotating is really half of a circle, so this, this is the parameter v, okay? put u equal to zero, and in the x, z plane, up to changing names, I can think of the blackboard of, of to, as the x, z plane, this is cos, u, cos v sine v, which is the parameterization of this piece. And of course, this will force v to be half of zero to pi. So for example, between zero and pi, okay? And then you rotate with u equal to zero, from zero to two pi. Okay. Well, the point is that in this, co in this situation, if you compute the first fundamental form, you get exactly some kind of the dual E is equal cos squared V, F is equal to zero, and G is equal to one. Okay. 
which looks very much like what you should have gotten from the construction of geodesic coordinates changing names. Okay, changing name, of course, here in, in the theorem we stated like E is equal to one and G is another function. Now here you just switch names. Basically you change names from U and V. You, you have to decide which is the first coordinate and which is the second, but who cares? That's just a convention and you get this, okay? So this looks like falling into our category. So the exercise is to decide that this is indeed the case and in which sense these coordinates come from this construction, okay? Now that you know what are, because on the sphere you know what are geodesics. So this construction is not just relying on the general existence theorem for geodesic, but here you can really write them down, okay? Okay, this was kind of to close that little, it's a, it's a small observation I wanted to do and I forgot last time. Okay, now let's move on and let's go back to drawing a picture of a surface. In R3, we have a curve, suppose you have a curve on S. Remember, we defined the notion of normal curvature to this cur of this curve, okay? Meaning what? If you think of this curve as a curve in R3, of course, here you have one special vector, which is the normal vector to the surface. You have the tangent vector. I mean, if this is gamma, this is gamma prime. But you have also another special vector, which is the, the normal vector to gamma as a, as a curve in R3, okay? So here you would have, and we changed name, okay? At the beginning of our course, this was also capital N. We decided to call it little n, okay? Now, this is some, in some sense the acceleration of the curve in R3. Of course, this vector will have in general two components. I mean, two geometrically important components. One is the normal component and one is the tangential component. I mean, you project this vector over the normal line or over the tangent plane to the surface, okay? And the normal curvature was what? <clears throat> was essentially the length of the normal component, okay? That leaves us with the problem of finding another name because somehow out of this information we have two information, the length of the normal component and the length of the tangential component, okay? So the length of the tangential component, so let me call it uh, N uh, tangential, okay? N tangential is by definition the projection of N on TPS, okay? The orthogonal projection on this plane. So the norm of this vector is called the geodesic curvature of gamma, which is of course a function, no? because this depends on the point. Now, we have already observed, this is just to give a, a simple name to something, I mean, to a symbol to, to something that somehow we have already used. Because we have already proved that a curve is a geodesic if and only if this function is identically zero, okay? Remember the geometric interpretation of the geodesic equation, okay? The acceleration of the curve is all normal. Well, if it's all normal, if you project it on the tangent space, you get the zero vector, so you get zero, okay? So this is just to introduce this symbol which is useful, 
but somehow we have already used. So geodesic, if and only if, k gamma is equal to zero, okay? At every point, of course, of the curve. Now, with this notation, we can state one of the most important theorems of this course. So this is called the local, well, let me not give it a name yet. A, a corollary of this will, be, will have a famous name. So theorem. Let gamma be a smooth, closed, simple curve on a surface S. In fact, on a patch, this in some sense it's a local on a patch of a surface S. Okay. Then we have the following integral equality. The integral, <coughs> oh, in fact, let me just to also to, to fix notation enclosing a region R. Okay, just to give something a name, this, this object and this domain a name. Then the integral over gamma of the geodesic curvature. Oh, sorry, change also this kg. Okay, g is for geodesic, independently of the curve, okay? It's better now. The integral of the geodesic curvature along this curve is 2 pi minus the integral over r of the Gauss curvature. And I always write dA to say, to mean the, the measure induced on the surface by the first fundamental form, okay? It's a square root of eg minus f squared du dv. Okay? It's the measure we use to do integrals over a surface. Okay? Now, think for a moment what, what are we saying? What is, what, you have a simple closed curve. If your surface was a plane, Well, here you are saying nothing, but I mean, in fact, let's not draw it on the plane because, uh, I mean, you have, you have, this is the picture you have to keep in mind. You have our curve gamma, and here you are taking the integral of the geodesic curvature, and this is the region R, because as usual, remember, I'm using the fact that a, a simple closed curve, so no self-intersection, remember, okay, smooth, closed, and no self-intersection means it splits the surface in two pieces, okay? And up to orientation of the curve, there will be one interior part and one exterior part, okay? So enclosing means the interior part. Okay, let's see how we prove it. How do we prove it? Of course, gamma, no, no loss of generality to assume gamma parameterized by arc length, okay? And suppose, and we fix, and everything, since everything is contained in a patch of a surface, let's give a name to this patch. So x from some domain v into r3 is the patch. which contains everything, okay? Because of course, as usual, I will try to pull everything back to the domain V. Now, exactly as we did in the proof of the theorem I gradium, we can choose two vector fields. Basically, orthonormalize xu and xv along the curve gamma. Okay, choose vector fields e1, e2 in R3 such that 
the pair E1, E2 is an orthonormal basis, is an orthonormal basis basis of TPS at the point P. Okay? The, these are vector fields. So every time I evaluate them at the point P, I get an orthonormal basis of TPS. Okay? And now restrict them and restrict them to the curve gamma. So the restriction of these vector fields, in, in principle, these vector fields would be, again, functions, I mean, vectors depending on two parameters, u and v, okay, on the patch. But if I restrict them to gamma, I can think them as functions of s. Okay, I'm looking them only here, only on these points. These points depend on s, so basically, and so on, okay? And I think of them as depending on S, okay? So as functions of S, I indicate E prime, this is just for a notation, E prime I, I mean, whatever I is equal to one or two, this would be by notation D in DS E I, okay? So the, the derivative with respect to the only parameter surviving. But now here in this picture, unfortunately, I should have drawn a much bigger, bigger picture in a bigger blackboard, but I mean, at this point, we have another special vector, which in principle has nothing to do with them, which is the tangent vector to the curve gamma, okay? So in fact, I'm assuming the, for example, okay, so my convention, the curve goes in this way. So gamma prime would be this vector here. Okay, but then since it's a tangent vector to the surface, it has to be a linear combination of these two. And since it's parameterized by arc length, it's a vector of norm one, okay? And they are both vectors of norm one. So the factors, I mean, basically gamma prime would be some cos theta E1 plus sine theta E2, because we are on a plane, okay? So, this defines theta, so let theta of s be the angle, be the angle between uh, gamma prime and E1, okay, for example. Of course, this, I mean, otherwise you can just say gamma prime is equal cos theta E1 plus sine theta E2, okay? Now, I'll try to save the picture, but I'm not sure I will succeed. So now, define another vector, which is useful, and I call it eta, which is nothing but uh, n cross gamma prime, okay? Now, n is the normal vector to the surface, so this vector is tangent to the surface, okay? And basically, it, this is the vector tangent to the surface orthogonal to gamma prime. So inside, gamma pri inside the tangent space, there is a special vector. And this vector is constructed to be basically the orthogonal to this one. Okay? So eta being orthogonal to this one is certainly equal to minus sine theta E1 plus cos theta E2, okay? So let's write some derivatives of these vectors. So the acceleration of gamma, which is nothing but gamma double prime, okay? So little n, if you want, okay? 
well, little n up to curvature, okay? No, uh, not unnormalized uh, by the curvature. Well, this is what? Uh, this is, this becomes theta prime eta plus cos theta e1 prime plus sine theta e2 prime, okay? This is nothing, I mean, I'm not cheating. Gamma double prime, take this equation. Gamma double prime is what? Well, when, I, when you put the derivatives on the vectors, I left them indicated, okay? So the point is, when I take the derivative of the angle, what, what's going on? Well, this becomes theta prime times minus sine theta E1, okay? plus theta prime cos theta e2. So this is exactly theta prime eta. Okay, the two contributions coming from the derivatives of these two functions are exactly theta prime eta. Okay, nothing mysterious there. So how much is the geodesic curvature? So the geodesic curvature of gamma is what? Is I should take the tangential part of, I take gamma double prime, no? You project on the, on the tangent space, but gamma double prime, I know it's orthogonal to gamma prime because gamma prime is a vector of norm one at every point. So as usual, if I take another derivative, I know I will get an orthogonal vector. Okay, so gamma double prime have no, comp I mean the projection in the tangent space has no component on gamma prime. Okay, so kg is equal to the scalar product between eta and gamma double prime. I mean it has to be all encoded in the normal direction to gamma prime. Okay. But this is what? Well, now we have a, a formula for gamma double prime. So this is um, theta prime. I mean, if I put this formula here, I will get eta cross eta, which is 1, because they are orthogonal and both of norm 1. So eta is norm 1, OK? Which I, it's something I already used. So this becomes theta prime plus or minus what? Well. Um, okay, let's do it. Cos theta, cos theta, E1 prime plus sine theta, E2 prime. This is the, I, I, need, I still need to compute the scalar product between this and eta, okay? And eta, which is that object there, minus sine theta, E1 plus cos theta, E2. Okay, so how much is this? E1 prime is orthogonal to E1. Again, by the usual thing. This is, these were nor, uh, of norm 1 at every point. E2 prime is orthogonal to E2. Okay? So this, this, I'm left with what? I'm left with cos square E1 prime E2 minus sine square E2 prime E1. But then I have the other equation. So here I've already used the fact that they have norm 1. But now I use the fact that they are orthogonal at every point. So I have the equation E1, E2 is equal to 0 at every point. So if I take the derivative with respect to S, for example, I get, I get that E1 prime E2 plus E1 E2 prime is equal to 0. So minus E1 E2 prime is equal to E1 prime E2. So this minus term, I can put it as a plus the other one. So I get cos squared plus sine squared, so 1 times, so why there's a minus, now? ah, okay, because I, I prefer to do the other way around. I prefer to keep the minus 1, so I kill the plus 1. So this becomes, I, I prefer to write it as minus E1, E2 prime, okay? And I can erase this. So here I used heavily the fact that I, this was an orthonormal basis at every point. 
I'll forget, forget the picture for a moment, okay? Now, let's see what are we trying to prove. We are trying to compute the integral of this function. Well, this is a simple closed curve. In particular, it's closed. So I can assume this is parameterized between 0 and 2 pi, okay? And so how much is the integral? Well, I, whatever. In fact, I, I don't even need to assume that this is parameterized. So how much is the integral of theta prime? whatever the, the, the domain of definition it is. Well, this is equal to 2 pi. Okay. It's kind of a whole rotation. This curve is doing one rotation on the surface. Okay. So, so in order to finish the proof, we need to compute the integral of this. Okay. How much is the integral of this object along the curve? So in fact, let me give it a name. So let me call it i, the integral over gamma of, with the plus sign, e1, e2 prime in the s. This is a function of s, OK? How do I do that? Well, I use, again, Green's formula. Remember when we studied the isoperimetric problem? That was a very useful formula which I remind you now. In fact, here, maybe this is a good place to, to remind you. If you take two functions of two variables over some domain of R2, which is bounded by a simple closed curve, okay, you, you know this formula here. The integral over gamma of P du plus Q dv, okay, this is equal of the integral of the interior region. Well. Maybe it would have been better to give another name, but OK. To, to the interior region, because this is a theorem on R2, OK? Of V0 of dQ. So if this was the one which was hitting V, I take the derivative with respect to U, minus dP dV, and now in dU dV, OK? This was Green's, Green's formula. the one we already used, and now we are going to use it again, OK? So in fact, this was a bad name. Let me call this beta, OK? Because this is a theorem on the domain in R2, OK? So this holds for any curve, simple closed curve in R2, which bounds a region V0. Now, what is my curve beta? Of course, my curve beta is the one which I find by pulling back gamma from the surface to the domain V. Okay? If you draw the usual picture, we are in the, in the usual situation. We have some patch, okay? and we have some simple closed curve here, which is gamma. But everything comes from some x in some domain V. And so here I will find a simple closed curve beta. Okay? And of course, the corresponding interior region will come from the corresponding interior region. OK? We are exactly in this situation. So, so beta, use beta. So this is beta. Beta will be some u of t, v of t. In fact, v of s. It's OK. Doesn't matter. This is the curve representing gamma. So that gamma becomes. Uh, x composed beta, as usual, OK? Now, why the computation on the domain should be easier? Well, what is e2 prime? e2 prime, in terms of the variables u and v, after all, I can think of e2 as a function of u and v, and then u and v as a function of t. So I can also do chain rule, OK? If I do that, this becomes u prime e to u in our standard notation now, plus v prime e to v, OK? So I define, I look, I'm looking for the, the right functions there, p and q, to use that formula. So define p 
to be the function e1 e2u. It's quite natural, no? Because now the function that I'm really interested in is the scalar product between e1 and d2 prime. So e2 prime, this will give a sum of two objects, which looks in the spirit of where we are going. So I define the first function basically to be p and the second function to be q. So q will be the other one. q will be e1 e2v. Okay. So how much is dq du with this choice? dq du minus dp dv is what? Well, dq du, just notice one thing, there will be one cancellation, OK? Because if I take the derivative of q with respect to u, if I take the derivative of this one with respect to u, I get e1u e2v. And then I should put plus e1 e2vu. But I will get the same term here when I take the derivative with respect to v. So I don't even write it. So minus dp dv. So this is minus e1v e2u. OK? I've already dropped the last. But this is, notice that this is exactly what came in in the proof of the theorem I gradium. And actually, we proved already that this is equal to eg minus f squared divided by eg minus f squared 1 half. OK? This, is, this was one of the famous formula we proved. But then, what does it happen when I apply When I apply Green's formula here, well, this object, I should integrate this object in du dv. But this is not the right thing that the surface is telling me. The surface would like the area measure, I mean the surface measure. The surface measure is given by square root of eg minus f squared du dv. So I need to, to multiply by that. But that means I have to divide by that. I multiply and divide by square root of eg minus f squared. OK? And what does it happen? This du dv becomes dA. And here, there was a 1 half missing. So this 1 half becomes without the 1 half. And this is exactly k. OK? And that proves the theorem. OK? So it's essentially, it's, an, it's another output of the proof of the, of the theorem I gradium. OK? Because this is, this, was, this is really the key point. OK? Now, there is a more fam famous version of this. So I keep the statement there. But it's just a, mo a modification of, of, of this one. Uh, well. Which is the case where gamma is not smooth. OK? What does it happen when gamma is not smooth? Well, of course, I cannot really do whatever I want. So I would like to restrict myself to, well, this is enough, to the case where the, the curve gamma is made of a finite number of pieces. So it's what is called piecewise smooth. OK. So let's try to make this extension. OK. So if gamma is piecewise smooth. What does it change in our proof? Well, actually, the part coming from Green's theorem, and so the estimate of this doesn't change, because Green's theorem doesn't care about possible angles, cusps, or whatever, 
okay, vertices in this thing. I mean, the points, there, is, there will be a finite number of points where the tangent vectors coming from the right and from the left are not the same. This is the difference, of course. Okay, you have a finite number of these points here. Okay, now, so this, the part coming from this term doesn't change. What about the part coming from this term? Well, now, this changes. In fact, before saying how, how much it changes, um, stand, I mean, how we have to give names to some of these objects. When you have a point, a vertex, in fact, even a smooth point, but in this case, you get angle zero. I mean, you have, you have an angle between these two tangent vectors, OK? You have a non-zero angle. So this is usually called the interior angle because, in fact, I mean, I draw it outside just not to confuse the picture, but it's the same as the one you usually draw inside, OK? And then there is an exterior angle, which is kind of the, com the complement of that. Okay, so this angle here will be called delta i. So here I have a finite number of points, pi, where this accident happens. Okay, at this point, I know that I have some, what is called an exterior angle, which is different from pi, of course. You can do the same thing at a smooth point, but in this case, delta will be pi. Okay. If this is delta, you, usually we call this is delta and this is alpha. So now it depends which one you prefer. In order to decide what's happening to this integral, it's basically easier to, to work with delta. Okay? Because what is the difference of the integral of theta prime when there is a jump? Well, that's exactly that. I mean, the integral of theta prime will be 2 pi minus the mistake. And how much is the mistake? Well, the mistake is exactly the amount of the jump. But what is the amount of the jump? Is the exterior angle. Okay, how much the tangent vector has to rotate to pass from one position to the other. Okay, so the, the, in this case, the difference would be that the integral of theta prime will be 2 pi minus the sum of delta i. Okay. Which, in terms, if you usually we are more used to work with the interior angles now. So, if alpha i, so if alpha i, so these are the exterior angles. In terms of alpha i, which is pi minus delta i, so the interior angle. What do we get? In fact, let me write it as if now, I, I left this just to comment on these two pieces. Now I want to write the general formula. So let me write it as a theorem. And now this has a famous name. This is called the local Gauss-Bonnet theorem. And this states the following. So gamma now would be a piecewise smooth simple. I still need to assume that there are no self-intersection and that this curve is closed, of course. Okay, simple closed curve. It's usually what you call a polygon, okay? But now this polygon is drawn on a surface, okay? It's not a planar polygon, okay? And in fact, I'm not even, in my picture, there is a little ambiguity. This, you might think this was kind of a straight line, almost a straight line. Here, nobody is telling me that this object here, in fact, doesn't even make sense on a surface to, pre to prescribe that these edges are straight. Okay, so these are kind of generalized on a surface. We are drawing really some kind of generalized polygons, okay? Okay, because the edges can be whatever they want. So gamma should be a curve like this with n 
sides. So let me give a, na a number to the number of sides, OK? And I call them n. And in with internal angles, alpha 1, alpha n, OK? On a smooth surface. Well, then, say, I mean, what we proved is this, which is better to, you, we are more used to write in this form, but it's exactly the same formula we get from here. So the integral, the sum of the, inter, of the internal angles to a polygon is equal to n minus 2. In fact, what if I asked you, now I've already written somehow the answer, but I mean, the sum of the interior angles of a old-fashioned polygon in R2 is how much? So really, our old high school polygons, OK? Straight lines with vertices, OK? Well, the sum of the interior angles is equal to n minus 2 pi. So in particular, the sum of it in a triangle, the sum of the internal, internal angles is pi, and so on, OK? On a, four edges, 2 pi, and so on, OK? So this is the complete generalization of this theorem, OK? On a surface, and now the edges are free to be whatever, whatever curve they want. But what is the correction? So basically, this theorem now becomes, well, take your high school theorem, and correct it with two objects. The two objects come from two, two reasons. The first reason why there is a correction is that, as I said, the edges are not straight lines. Okay? And where do I see it? I see it here. Okay? Why? Well, if gamma was a straight line between two vertices, of course, kg would be 0. In this case, n, OK? I mean, there is no normal vector. Geodesic curvature, OK? Geodesic curvature is 0. In fact, in fact, this is a nice observation to do in any case. If, if a surface contains a piece of a straight line, a segment, this segment has to be a geodesic, OK? In fact, this you can prove it automatically by comparison. I mean, a geodesic is a critical point of length. A segment is a critical. In fact, in this case, it's a minimum of length, OK, automatically. Because if it wasn't a minimum on a surface, it would not be a minimum even in R3. So even in R3, you would have a curve which joins the two verti vertices of the, of the segment with less length, which is impossible, OK? So you can argue immediately without doing any computation that a segment must be a piece of a geodesic every time a surface contains a segment, OK? So the first correction comes from the fact that edges are not segments. And, and it's, it's encapsulated in this term. But somehow, the second correction is even more interesting, and much more interesting. Because the second correction comes from the fact that you are on a surface. And this surface may be flat or not. And this introduce, introduces this correction. OK? Plus, uh, now becomes a plus, OK? Because I'm putting, you see, you have to take this formula with uh, with alpha delta i is equal alpha i minus pi. Put it there and put everything on the left, OK? So these are the right signs, OK? So the sum of the interior angles of a polygon on a surface is our Euclidean guess plus correction coming from the fact that the edges are not geodesics, while in high school we gave by definition of polygon something which has segments as edges plus the fact that the surface is non-flat, OK? Now, this theorem is kind of a fundamental both in the applications and conceptually, 
okay? Because in history of, I mean, of course the case n equal to three is enough. I mean, that it's essentially the general case. So the fact that the sum of interior angles of a triangle in the plane is equal to pi is a statement which is kind of equivalent to the fifth postulate. And you probably you know that for more than 2,000 years, mathematicians have tried to check whether the fifth Euclidean fifth postulate, the Euclidean fifth postulate is the one which says, given a line and a point outside, there is one and only one line passing through this point parallel to this. Okay? There is one and only one. Euclid put it as a postulate. Okay? It's not a theorem. Well, question. Is it a theorem? Now, this was a very disturbing problem for mathematicians for more than 2,000 years. Okay? But really, big fights. Okay? Somebody claimed to have proved it. So, out of the first four postulates. So, using the first postulate, are you able to, to prove the fifth? Somebody claimed yes, somebody claimed no, and so on. Well, actually, this formula, again, I mean, if you can read the formula, you get the solution. Okay? Okay? Because, of course, everything boils, so, in fact, Euclid was right. It is a postulate. So, Euclidean geometry is that geometry where you have to assume the first four plus this. This is not automatic out of the first four. Okay? Because in general, if, if, if you live, instead of living on a plane, you live on another surface and you don't even know because it's your universe, so you cannot really say. Okay? And you think of doing a geometry where the notion of line is substituted with the notion of geodesic, okay? Because that's your notion of line. That's your natural notion of straight line. After all, why we think a line is something more natural because it's our intuition of uniform motion, no? So if you, if you think of being a bug living on a surface, you would say, well, there, was, there would be a, a bug called Euclid coming up with his geometry and telling you, giving the name straight lines to what we would call a geodesic looking from outside, okay? Now, the problem is, if you substitute these things, I mean, you have to be logically consistent. I mean, you, you cannot prove postulates, okay, by, by definition, okay? But I mean, it is true that you can, geodesics on its surfaces do indeed verify, I mean, at least in, for some surfaces, I mean, you can check that do verify the first four, but the fifth will fail, okay, because of this. And in fact, the postulate can fail in two possible ways, because the postulate is telling you two things. There exists one and only one, okay? So, of course, the, if this is not true, if you think that this is not true, you, it can be true, it can be false in two ways. Maybe there are none, or maybe there are more than one, okay? And in fact, these two things are two geometries. There are, these geometries exist. One is elliptic geometry, and one is hyperbolic geometry, okay? Elliptic, why elliptic, what is elliptic geometry? Elliptic geometry is that you are a bug living on the sphere, okay? And you think of a geodesic, now you know everything about geodesics on the sphere, so you think of a geodesic as, as a straight, I mean, you, sub, you take the book of Euclid and you substitute the word line, the word geodesic, okay? And now, given a straight line, and given a point outside, how many, geode how many lines passing through this point? What the parallel, of course, means they don't intersect. Okay? How many parallel lines pass through this point? Parallel to this one? None. Okay? Whatever you do, you will have to cross this equator. Okay? But then, okay. So this is one, one way you can, the, the, the postulate can fail. The other way is by constructing some kind of geometry where given a line, 
And the point outside there is more than one. I will show it to you next time. Okay? A hyperbolic, a model for hyperbolic geometry. Okay? Where again you substitute the word line to geodesic, geodesic to line, and uh, everything holds except this fifth postulate. Okay, so this was the end of the story, which was a very complicated story because what is really behind this is this mental game to be a bug, which sounds strange. I mean, it, it took thousands of years okay, to realize that it's a good game. Okay? But you don't have to, I mean, criticize too much our ancestors. Okay? There, was, there were religious, philosophical, whatever reasons to believe that Euclidean geometry was geometry, some kind of God-given. Okay? So there was one absolute truth. Okay? And the truth, we, we, we would live inside the truth because in some sense there was one, only one geometry, which was Euclidean geometry. Okay? So to break this wall, now it looks very stupid. I mean, you say, okay, draw a sphere and substitute a word to another word and, and that's it. Okay, but somehow this would have been considered heresy. I mean, the idea that this could be a universe was against some philosophical principle. Okay, so now, of course, when once we started exploring the universe on a larger scale than just our solar system, it became clear that this was not at all a game, and probably, actually, our universe is not. And in fact, now we know that it's not a Euclidean, exactly Euclidean universe, okay? So, respect for our grand, 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 grandparents, okay? <laughs> Even though at the end, now it, I mean, you see, it's also, I must say, it's part of the beauty of mathematics, okay? You work hard, and you prove a formula, okay? And then, that's it, okay? Looking at the form, I mean, I think mathematicians, it's, it's a beautiful part of our job. Not every formula is the same, okay? There are technical formula, there are some formula really contain fantastic informations, okay? And this is one of them. I, I, in some sense, in fact, Gauss proved this fact. And when Gauss proved this theorem, he, clo he finished his book. It was clear to him, and this is known by history, in history of mathematics, it was clear to him what I tried to tell you as kind of consequences of this formula. But he didn't want to, he, didn't, he was not brave enough to state it openly. Okay, that was, this, this formula is kind of the end of the philosophical supremacy of Euclidean geometry against something else. Okay, but he stopped. That's the end of his famous book on surfaces. Okay. And it, it, they were, it had to be by Lo Boilai and Lobachevsky who came up with the consequences. And to showing that actually there are models, actually there is only one bit of information missing here. If you assume that the postulate fails, you have to give me a model. Okay. Because maybe it's just an intellectual game, but they don't exist. But I can show you next time it's quite easy to construct a model. That this is not really the problem. So uh, it was them who said to everybody, look, now Euclidean geometry is dead because of this, essentially. Okay? And, and they, they had to pay for it. Okay? Gauss was quite in his observatory in Gottingen, okay, looking at stars, and the, and in fact, the only thing, one of the two, I don't remember if it was Boli or Lobachevsky, one, one of their father was a friend of Gauss, was another kind of amateur mathematician, friend of Gauss, and he wrote Gauss asking, what is your opinion on these crazy ideas my son is going around to say? And there is the famous answer by Gauss, I cannot make any kind of praise for your son's achievements because actually they were mine which is a very nice answer, no? I mean, <laughs> it's a very generous answer to a father, okay? <laughs> so he was claiming the once they were sent to, to, to war, I mean, into some, somewhere to pay for their, uh, I mean, for, for being against the church and everything. Now, after 20 years, he was 
saying, ah, no, 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 but this is my discovery, no? and, uh, when it's too late. I mean, no, this is not really accepted. This was not really the best page of Gauss history. Okay? Now, but now let's make one further step. Everything we did was inside the, actually here I didn't write it, okay, but it's clear. I mean, I'm using the same proof. So the, the image of this curve has to lie inside the patch, okay? Is there a kind of a global theorem now that we can extract out of this? And this is even more beautiful. Of course, the hint is here, no? There is a local Gauss Bonnet. There should be a global Gauss Bonnet somewhere. And now, let's face it. Now, before, before telling you what is the global Gauss Bonnet, okay, I erase this, but I keep the, I will write down again the formula up on top of the blackboard. So the sum of the interior angles is equal n minus 2 pi plus the integral of kg plus the integral of kda. Okay, so remember that this is now in our bag. Let's make one step back, because a little bit of topology. Now, if you have a surface, one way to extract some topological information out of, out of a surface is the following. Basically, probably most, most of you know, so I'm, I'm driving in the direction of the definition of the Euler characteristic. Okay, of a, of a general surface. And in fact, this holds not even in R3. I mean, you can define this object, the, the, the Euler characteristic for much more general objects. But let's see, definition. So I want to say that a subdivision of a surface, of a compact, actually let's restrict for simplicity, of a compact surface, S, is a partition with, some, with the following properties. In two, three subsets possibly empty eh? subsets that I call S0, S1, and S2, okay? Such that one, S0 is given by a finite number of points. Okay, S0 is P1, and I call it the last PV. V stands for vertex, okay? Is a finite percent of points. The PI are called vertices of the subdivision. S2, S1, is in fact an, a, a, a set of curves on the surface, okay? So it's a disjoint union. They don't have to intersect. Disjoint union of finitely many subsets, of subsets, the fact that they are finite, it's part of my notation, so of subsets, let me call it E1, E, okay? contained in S. So what do I mean they are curves? Of course, I mean that each of them, for each EI, there, uh, there are vertices. So they have to start and then and end in one of the vertices. Okay? For each EI, there are P and Q in S0, okay, in, the, in the list above and continuous <coughs> injections. I want to realize them as maps, injective maps, Fi from 0, 1. It's not important because this is just topological, so I don't care where, how big is the, defini is the defining, is the domain of the functions Fi, okay? 0, 1 to S such that of course, F0 is equal to P, F of 1 is equal to Q, okay? And F restricted to uh, 
Okay. And f restricted to the open subpart 0, 1. Okay. This surjects onto EI. Okay. So okay, by this notation I mean, of course, this EI would be the open curve, okay, without the, the two extremes, the two vertices, okay? Because now okay, it's clear. Sorry, fi restricted to 0, 1 is equal to, uh, surjects on to ei. Okay, this ei, ei, or such ei, are called edges. Are called edges of the subdivision. Okay. Note, there is no reason, here I never said that p is different from q. Okay, so in principle they could be loops. Okay, it's allowed. It's not forbidden by the definition. And then the condition on three, on S2, the condition three is about what is S2. S2 has to be a, a disjoint union, again. But now, of open subsets. that I call F1, this is not a great notation after the previous, but I mean, I don't know how to call them, so F1, FF, okay? Each of which, and this is important, each of which is homeomorphic to a disk. Okay. Of course, these fi, these are, well, don't confuse, nothing to do with the previous f, okay? Actually, these f will never appear in anything. I mean, these fj are called faces. So we have vertices somewhere, vertices, edges, and faces, okay? <clears throat> so examples. Well, take for example, I'm restricting myself to compact surfaces, okay? So the simplest thing we can think of is the sphere. Let me do not draw anything. In fact, even this equator is already misleading in some sense because I don't want to think of this equator now as one of these edges. It's just to tell you it's a sphere, okay? So now, how can I take a subdivision of the sphere? Well, this is the kingdom of freedom. You can do almost whatever you want. But for example, just to show you, if I take this equator, I have to define S0, S1, and S2. In fact, here, the thing, my suggestion is that somehow the most difficult thing to get in general is this homeomorphic to a disk. So, Try to split your surface in pieces which are homeomorphic to disks. Well, in a way that what is left over are curves. Okay, this is the idea behind the subdivision. Of course, every surface, in fact, every regular surface can certainly be covered by patches. And every patch, if you want, it's homeomorphic to a disk, if your original domain was a disk, okay? But you see, here I need disjoint union. So patches are very bad in this sense, okay? The, in fact, the interesting part of differential geometry is where patches overlap, okay? Otherwise, there's not really too much to say, okay? So for a sphere, for example, how can I write it as a disjoint union of some number of disks? Well, separate the sphere with an equator, and then the upper and the lower half of, are disks. Okay, and what I'm left? Well, I'm left with one edge. Okay, so here, for example, I can just put one vertex there. So you see, here I have. Now, if I don't add a, a vertex, this would not be a subdivision. I need to have a vertex because remember I've said EIs are kind of the open intervals, okay? 
because f restricted to the open part has to subject in, injectively, okay? So to EI. So that means EI is really the equator minus a point. If I want, the vertex is this point. So this is P, this is E, and these are, so P1. I have only one vertex, only one edge, and two faces. Okay? Well, okay, this is one subdivision. In fact, I can even do something even more pathological. This was starting from the problem of faces, but actually starting from the possible, if, if you want to write the sphere as a disjoint union of disks minus something of lower dimension, this is kind of the idea. No? Well, there is an even more stupid thing to do, stereographic projection. Okay, so if I remove only one point, what is left is homeomorphic to a, to a disk. Okay, so the, strange enough, this is a subdivision. And it's a subdivision made of what? Made of one vertex and one face. Okay. But then of course, okay, then, then I, can, I can think of a bit more geometrically, for example, start slicing your orange, okay, in the usual way. And this is another subdivision, okay? Each of these triangle is a disk, okay? So I don't even want to count. There will be many vertex, many faces, and many edges, okay? But now the strange thing, the miracle. I, I, I have no way to convince you that this was a logical thing to guess. Compute V minus E plus F. Okay, now the point is, at least on these three examples, well, in fact, okay. let's make the simplest of these, okay, just to check what's going on. Okay, the simplest of these is with two equators, okay. How many vertex do I have? I have one. One, two, three, four. Four, five, strange, should be six, oh, six, okay, and six. Okay, six, so V is equal to six here. How many edges? One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Oh, no, because I also, <laughs> okay, how many? I've counted them here, so. One, one, two, three, four. Yeah, I have four for each slice, no? Okay, so E, okay. And how many F? How many faces? Eight. Now, the key point is that this subject here is always the same. Whatever you do, you always get two, okay? Notice another thing. So, in fact, definition. This is too important to leave it like this. So the Euler characteristic of S relative to, the, to do a subdivision, because in principle it depends to the subdivision uh, let's let me call it uh, this was not a good idea to call it a zero s one uh, let me call it uh, curl p okay the subdivision so a subdivision p like partition in some sense okay so that is but you use this symbol, chi of S P, and it's equal to V minus E plus F. Okay, so this is the Euler characteristic relative to this uh, subdivision here. So one of the, 
in some sense elementary, but most, uh, I mean, it's a del delicate theorem in, in topology of this type, is to prove that this number does not depend on the subdivision, but only on the surface. So theorem. chi of s p is equal chi of s p prime for any p p prime subdivision. Okay. I'm not going to prove it because this is nothing, this is basic topology, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a smart proof, okay? You can find it in standard, in the books of algebraic topology or something like that. How many of you have seen, for example, this, this proof? Well, okay. Now this is a key fact, of course, plus another key theorem. Because I ran a little bit forward, say, okay, if I have a subdivision, I can compute its Euler characteristic. Its Euler characteristic is independent of the subdivision and so on. But now, there is another key theorem behind the scene, is that any surface has a, sub a subdivision, okay? Which is non-trivial, okay? Every compact surface has one subdivision. Because otherwise our, our theory would be a bit empty, okay? Now, this is in fact more difficult than the previous one, okay? You have to construct it by hand. <clears throat> now, put the two things together. If I take a surface, I have at least one subdivision, I can compute its Euler characteristic and it's independent of the subdivision. So this number is a number which depends only on S and it's called just the Euler characteristic of the surface, okay? With obvious notation. This number, it's an integer of course, because it's E minus V plus F, is also a topological invariant. If you have two surfaces, which are homeomorphic, then of course, if I take a subdivision on the left, the image is a subdivision on the right. The number of vertices, edges, and faces is the same because it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, okay? So two homeomorphic surface, surfaces have the same Euler characteristic. Now, this is one of the things that for a mathematician, I mean, it's fantastic. You say, ah, so maybe I can classify surfaces just by looking at one number. So which are the surfaces which have Euler characteristic two up to homeomorphism? Because this is really a question in topology. I mean, here you don't need a metric or a first fundamental form, nothing. I mean, this is a topological question. And in fact, this, this is, I mean, this is a beautiful part of topology. It can be done. And in fact, this, this sphere is the only compact surface up to homeomorphism with Euler characteristic two. Okay, so this number really gives a classification of, of surfaces. Okay, so two surfaces with the same Euler characteristic are indeed homeomorphic if they are orientable. Okay. What else do I want to say on this? Well, let's play another game just to, because otherwise you might think we, have building a we are building a theory on the sphere. So let's take a, what is another simple compact surface that we know, for example. Well, the, the torus, for example, the torus of revolution. But you see, being a topological question, the fact that it's exactly of revolution, you don't really care. Okay, this topological surface. Are we able to compute its Euler characteristic? Well, if we don't make mistakes, yes. The best way, one way would be to imagine things here. But this is, at least I find it a bit confusing. 
I would prefer to have, since it's a topological invariant, to have another topological model, okay? If I have another topological model which is better for this problem, I use that. So what is, in fact, this surface topologically? Well, topologically, well, in fact, even more than topologically, but I mean, this is one circle rotating around. So topologically, this is S1 cross S1. S1 is the circle, okay? It's the product of two circles, okay? And how can I draw it? Well, it's the usual. One, when, you, when you realize it in the usual way, you first make the cylinder, and then out of the cylinder, you identify the two circles by closing it up. What are you really doing? What are you doing? You are making a mathematical operation, which is this. You are taking a square or a rectangle, I don't care, it's topology, so they are all the same, something like this, and you are identifying, so first make the cylinder, so there is an equivalence relation on this topological space. I'm taking this with the topology induced by R2, okay? So this is a topological space. On this, on this object, I look at the equivalence relation which identifies this point with this point, this point with this point, no? When you close them. So, there is an identification between this edge and this edge. Homologous, okay? So point at the same height, go to point at the same height. And then, once you do that, this edge has become a circle because these two points have come together. So now the second identification is identifying the two circles in the same way. But that's exactly the same thing. So it's this edge identified with this edge. Now, the, the topological space that you have produced by this equivalence, so the quotient space, is exactly this, okay? But now here I can find subdivisions much easier because I don't, I'm not going around the hole, okay? In some, some, in some sense, I've cut up the torus in a way that now it looks like a square, okay? So as long as I don't forget the equivalence relation, I'm done. Because what? Because in fact, I've already drawn a subdivision. You see, the inside of this is a disk topologically. The square is the same thing, okay? So this, this looks like my face. Well, it, his face, its face, <laughs> okay? Now, and now, and how many edges do I have? It's four modulo the equivalence relations. The relation, but so for modulo, the equivalence relation is what? Is two, okay? And then how many vertices do I have? Four, because it's a square. Modulo, the equivalence relation? One, they are all the same because this goes here, this goes here by transitive property, everything is the same. So I have one vertex, how many edges? Two, two edges and one face. So the Euler characteristic of this is zero. And again, it's the only compact orientable surface with zero Euler characteristic. Okay? So if for some mysterious reason you don't know which, space, which compact, if you know it's orientable, otherwise you have to be slightly more careful. If you are able to compute the Euler characteristic without knowing too much about the surface, you can actually uh, tell me topologically what is your space. It's quite fantastic, okay? Now, okay, here there's a whole subject here, but this goes beyond our course, okay? Because now out of a subdivision, you can produce many subdivisions. I mean, there are operations that you can do in the space of subdivisions to go to, from one to another, but we don't, really, we don't care. Let me finish. So the last, in five minutes, I will give you the global version of this, okay? I will use now all these theorems and these definitions to put everything together. In the most famous formula in the differential geometry of surfaces, this is something you are not allowed to forget. So theorem, 
And this is called Gauss Bonnet formula or theorem as you want. I mean, put whatever name as long as there are these two names on top. If you take a compact, smooth, regular surface S is a compact, smooth surface in R3, then the integral of the Gauss curvature over S, okay, over the whole thing, which is something you compute by chart by chart with our measure, okay, so you know what this means, in dA, this is equal to 2 pi times the Euler characteristic, okay? Beauty at its best, okay? Let's first, let me give you quickly the proof because it's essentially playing with, with this. Basically, you have to convince yourself, so now you have your compact surface, okay? It's difficult to draw a picture, I mean, a sensible, I cannot really draw a, a subdivision, okay? But what, what's going on? You take the local version. Right, so basically, a subdivision is really giving you a decomposition of your surfaces in faces, edges, and vertices, okay? So the idea is to apply the lock. And in fact, you can also assume, this is what I was saying, there is a whole theory, but it's quite kind of simple. You can even assume that you have reached a subdivision where each of the, in fact, it's all made of triangles, if you want. And each triangle is contained in a patch. Because after all, if it's not true, you can go, you can make it smaller and smaller and smaller, no? And sooner or later, you will have to end up inside the patch. So as, Allowing the possibility of making your subdivision more and more complicated, if you want, with more faces, more edges, and more vertices, you know that it will be made by triangles with each triangle contained in a patch. Okay, so that you can assume, you can apply to each triangle this, uh, the local version of the theorem. Okay, this is completely... Now... Mm. Now, every time you have a vertex of your subdivision, you see, if I look at this triangle here, I, I, that means I'm looking at this piecewise smooth curve. I'm looking only at the contribution at this vertex. At this vertex, I would have an interior angle, if you want, okay? So think of making the sum of all of this formula over all possible faces. Okay, so faces and corresponding curve gamma. Okay, now instead, imagine that you are doing it. Doesn't matter. It's a finite sum, so this is not a C. This will be a finite number of things. Okay, how? What happens at each vertex of the subdivision? Well, at each vertex of the subdivision, um, you get two pi. Okay. The sum of these angles, as I move around at each vertex, has to be 2 pi, okay? So on the left, I get 2 pi v, v because I have v vertices, okay? okay? This is the contribution coming from the left. Now, each edge belongs to two polygons, okay? It cannot belong to more than two, and it has to belong to two, okay? Because it will have one side on one, one right and one left, okay? Now, so the edge, of course, comes here. I should compute the integral of the geodesic curvature of this edge, and I have no idea. Either I argue that I can find the subdivision made of geodesics, which is also true, but forget it now, okay? Whatever it is, the point is that, you see, I decided that when I take a curve, I go around in one way, for example, counterclockwise, because I need to speak about the interior. So the interior is what is on the 
left of the curve. Okay, in order to speak about the left, I need to decide what is the, the movement of, on each curve. So when I, when I look at this triangle here, this edge here is, is, goes in this way. When I look at this triangle here, it goes in the opposite way. And then actually I think I should make a correction at the beginning of the lecture. I gave you the notion of geodesic curvature without sign. So for me it was, I told you the norm of, well, it comes with a sign. Maybe I'll correct it at the beginning of next lecture, okay? Because in order to speed up, I told you, pick the norm of the norm. But geodesic curvature comes, ah, no, 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 sorry, sorry, it doesn't matter. In fact, I think I need to correct, I mean, because while I teach something, I think to what I said before, but that's another, that, that's not important. The geodesic curvature, of course, at each point is the same of this curve. Once, if I look it on one side or the other side, it's the same point on the same curve. So whatever it is, it's the same. But the problem is that the integral in one way would go from zero to one, and the other way will go from one to zero. They are, okay? So it's one of the opposite the other. So in fact, edges do not contribute, okay? Except for this, actually, I so this one will disappear in the total sum. But this one, how many times does it come in, in, into this? How many times I have to take that? Well, this one, I have to take 2 pi e minus f times. OK, now I'm already over time, so I leave you time to think about the number of, OK? And then, of course, how much is this? Well, this is the easiest because, of course, the, re the, the whole surface is the union of the faces, and the fa each face is the interior of this polygon, minus a set of measure zero. So taking the integral, the sum of the integral over the faces and the integral of, over the whole surface is the same thing because what you are missing are a bunch of curves. Do you agree? So this one will sum up to this. And now put these objects together, and you get gauss bonnet OK? So now, really, it's the local theorem, which this is just drawing the right picture, OK? The local theorem is the one which contains all the geometric information. OK, so maybe next time I'll, uh, we will comment on corollaries of this.